I just created a fitness business at 17 years old that did six figures in profit, you know, in under a year before I got to college, any of that. And so I was like, I can help people grow on Instagram and get more clients and build their business from Instagram. And that's something where I can actually charge more too, which will lead me to making more money. Yeah. And so what I did was I What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Stick Talk podcast. We're here with the boy, Jerry Medici. What's going on, brother? What's going on, guys? Thank you for having me. Absolutely, dude. Thank I mean, we were talking us. a little bit. Yeah, thank you for having us. <laughs> First Not in our regular setup, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us here, bro. We're in Miami. But um, we were talking a little bit off camera downstairs, getting ready for the pod. And you're telling us just all the things you're doing in business with the SaaS, with the agency, with the real estate. And it's just beyond impressive for what? You said 23 years old? Yep unbelievable so Thank you. where does all that drive and motivation come from at such a young age yeah so i actually started business at seven years old this always shocks everyone um but at seven years old you know i moved from uruguay a third world country at two oh, years okay. old and so my parents you know moving here struggled financially mm -hmm. they never were like ceos or business owners they were always employees um so essentially at like seven years old i already started like you know living in miami you know seeing luxury things and stuff started to dream but I knew I was never going to be able to afford that lifestyle if it didn't come from my own actions. So at seven, you know, I started buying and, you know, actually what I did was I started off by cleaning shoes. So I would go to like some of the older kids in school and ask if I can clean like their Jordans and stuff Hell yeah. so I can make enough to buy my first pair of shoes. And then I went with my dad and we camped outside of like Foot Locker Champs. Yes, like we bro. would do that like once a month. And we would buy the shoes, you know, for 120 bucks, sell yep. them on Facebook, you know, different Facebook groups for like 300, yes. make a profit, kept doing that until I was like 13, 14. And then 13, 14, I started reselling ultra rolling loud tickets, making <laughs> yeah. a lot of profit Bro, doing go. that. Um, and then like 15, 16, 17, I would throw like all the events in high school, like the pregame bus, you know, the <laughs> homecoming, you know, the proms, yeah. all that stuff. I would host those events. And then at 17, Throughout this whole time, I was always a soccer player, too. So I got a lot of discipline from, like, waking up every day for practice, you know, going to sleep late, having to wake up in the morning to finish my homework, you know, all that different stuff. Um, and then so at 17, I was in really good shape. And people were always asking me, you know, how can I transform my body? Like, what are you eating? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And then I had, you know, all this experience from all these little businesses that I was doing growing up. So I was like, wow, this can be, like, my first, like, official Instagram business, yeah. you know, where I'm making money every day. It's not like, you know you know, like occasional stuff. So that's when I launched my first Instagram business, which was a fitness business. So I started okay. making workout meal plans for people. And then I built it into an e-com store as well. So like I would sell you these workout plans and meal plans. And then I'd also give you products that you can buy. So like pull-up bars, you know, ab simulators, like all these different like dumbbells, all these different equipment tools okay. that you can use, you know, inside of that fitness and workout program. And then what I realized was, you know, not everyone can afford, you know, to transform their body if, you know, they're not making money, right? They can't afford good food. They can't afford a gym membership. So I started becoming extremely passionate about helping people make money. Okay. So I started simply just like showing people how, you know, they can build a personal brand, showing people how they can scale their business. And then all of a sudden I realized, you know, I just created a fitness business at 17 years old that did six figures in profit, you know, in under a year before I got to college, any of that. And so I was like, I can help people grow on Instagram and get more clients and build their business from Instagram. And that's something where I can actually charge more too, which will lead me to making more money. Yeah. And so what I did was I dropped out of college moved to New York at the age of 18, opened up an office, and I launched the agency, grow with this agency. And so once I launched that, essentially I started charging, you know, with the workout plan, I was charging only like 120 bucks. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, expensive. And then now my minimum ticket was 1500. So same amount of work I would do, you know, on 10, on 10 calls, you know, yeah. I'd make it in one call, right? So that's essentially how, you know, I got to this, this point of where I'm at now. You know, I launched the agency, it was high ticket. Now I've been doing that for five years. Um, we've done over 10 million in sales. So that's kind of how, where I got to where I am now. Dude, crazy story, especially with yeah. the reselling and not even being born in the US and having to adjust obviously to the different culture. So there's a lot to unpack there. We also all got our start through like reselling and capping at it. Like yeah, I, I was seeing that when I was checking yeah. your page out. Yeah, that's a great start, bro. Um, and so you, you said like Instagram businesses, right? Like that was your first Instagram business. Like yep. Instagram was popping off around that time. So like, when did you first learn that like these businesses lived on Instagram and that was the place to be? So kind of just like through like, you know, just seeing stuff on Instagram, right? So 
Instagram started like I think in like 2013, 2012, mm -hmm. around then. So kind of, you know, after three years of being on there, you start, you know, seeing the ads, you start yeah. seeing the entrepreneurs, you know, you start dreaming a bit. And so that's probably what happened. You know, I just started seeing stuff, realized I can do this myself. And then that's when I just started, you know, the business. That's huge. Nice, man. You think Miami played a big factor in that too? I think definitely, you know, moving from Uruguay to Miami, if I was living in Uruguay, I probably wouldn't have the same drive, the same inspiration. You know, when you see other yeah. luxury stuff and you want those things as well, you know, it gives you that drive to yeah, go yeah. out there and get it. So definitely Miami. I think environment's so important, dude. Like if you live in East Bumfuck, Tennessee, like you're not really motivated. You don't see the cars, the, the houses, the watches and stuff like that. You're like, oh, this is just average what I can expect as, you know, my lifestyle. But then you move here. It's like all these people have money. 100%. Why can't why can't I? So definitely. And being around those people that have the money, like the opportunities, I'm sure you've built a great network here and have gotten business connections and opportunities that way. Of course. Um, just being in Miami and being who you are. So one thing I want to get more into is your agency, right? So that was like the first legitimate business model you got into after, you know, the, the flipping, the reselling. Or the, the, the fitness, fitness business. Yeah, the fitness business and then the agency. So you said you went to New York and opened an office like yeah. What'd that look like? It's like an 18 year old, 18 years old. Yeah. New York City is a scary lease place. That, yeah. Can you sign a lease at that age? Like, yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> that's crazy, dude. Yeah. So it's actually like a WeWork. So I think okay. they're like more comfortable and like, you know, yeah. signing and like it's month to month and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, that was the first thing I did. So I didn't want to like be the kid that like drops out of school and like go lives with their parents. So I was like, I'm dropping out of school. I'm moving to New York. I'm paying all my bills and I'm getting an office. That's so huge. And then that's kind of like what motivated me to maximize my revenue each month, right? If you don't have bills you have to pay, you know, you may slack off or whatever. So me, you know, putting myself in that position, leaving college, already having to make substantial income, you know, it was something that motivated me and it also helped me build a team, right? I wasn't in that office alone. I was bringing in team members. That's when I hired my first employees, you know, mm -hmm. new sales reps that I was training. People would come in, I would do meetings in the office, right? So it's definitely a big, you know, step to, getting into, you know, being a real agency owner and not just, you know, somebody online, you know, doing things for fun. There's the, always this question. So we do a lot of coaching with younger guys, especially in the agency space. And a lot of them have like this limiting belief is like, oh, I'm, I'm young. Yeah. Like, why would an older client or an established business person trust me with their money or with these services? So like, how do you overcome maybe that limiting belief? Or what would you say to that younger agency owner that's struggling with, I'm just not old enough to be taken seriously? Definitely. I think for somebody who's younger and they're trying to land, you know, some big clients, the number one tip of advice that I would give is to offer them the service for free. Love right. It. Because once you offer them the service for free and you show them that you can actually get them results, mm -hmm. age becomes, you know, out of the question. Right. Yeah. Don't no really matter. Anymore. People just want results. People just want to make money. Um, a lot of times people are entitled and think that they can land a client, you know, without getting them results or without proving themselves. I think if you have that belief that you're young and that's what's holding you back, simply offer it yeah. for free. And if you offer your services for free to enough people and you're actually providing a good service, you're going to land clients and be able to launch a successful agency that way. For me, you know, kind of in my perspective, I didn't have that belief, right? So I would just hit up anyone and everyone. I didn't care, you know, what yeah. they thought of my age. Um, you know, I definitely did, you know, go that route also. You know, there was some bigger ticket clients. Like in New York, one of the things I started doing was like going to restaurants and like pitching them in person and stuff. Nice. And so like they would see me in person, they would see my age, but I would just be like, give me a week, you know, I'll show you the service, yeah. show you what we do. And then I was able to land a lot of clients like that. And you take yourself very seriously. I think that's like a, a big way, a big part of it too. Like just the way you go about yourself. Like you're very professional. Right? 100%. And people see that, especially when you're doing these in-person meetings. And I'd imagine they're at some high level places in New York. Yeah, exactly. And that's a really good point. I think that if age, you know, is a factor, do things that impress people so much and think you're way beyond your years. So what does that mean? That means if you're going to make, you know, a proposal, if you're going to make a deck, don't make it, you know, on Google Docs where it looks super <laughs> unprofessional and unmodern, you know, make it incredible, right? If you don't have the skill sets, find somebody who you can pay some money that you, you know, have saved up and make something that's worthwhile, make something that look, makes you look beyond your years. And then that's what's going to help people, you know, build that trust and establish yeah. that relationship. Where do you think the maturity came from? Like 18, signing clients, going to dinners with high level people, renting an office in New York. <laughs> Most 18 year old kids are like stressing over like going to college and yeah, like trying to build their class yeah. like am i gonna What's go my out curriculum? this weekend <laughs> yeah and you got like a business running what was that yeah like? so i think you know times are different you know if, if we were in the you know 1900s or something maybe i wouldn't have like the same maturity or same inspiration what's part I think, of the 1900s i'm saying i think <laughs> like, it came from like us living in this era yeah. where we have social media yeah. and you're able to see other people doing it yep 
that's what brought that maturity, right? Like I was always somebody succeeding as an entrepreneur and in business before seeing other people doing it like on social media. So then when I saw other people doing it like with social media with a different route, I knew that I was gonna be able to do that same thing. And so it just came to, you know, wanting it more than the other person, studying more than the other person, staying up late, yeah. you know, waking up early, doing all these things. And where that came from, that came from, you know, just the drive that I know if I wanted to have a Lamborghini at 22 years old, you know, own real estate, yeah. if I wanted any of these things, it was gonna come and, you know, needed to start at an early age. So that's where it came from. Was there yeah. one or two guys that stick out that you saw and you're like, not in an asshole way, but like, if he can do it, I can definitely do it. There were, there's not really anyone that, that sticks out. It was more just like scrolling and just seeing like different people. There wasn't like a specific, you know, person, but it was just seeing multiple people just doing it. Yeah. yeah. yeah I how, love that. Yeah. How do you like qualify people on Instagram, like making sure that they're legit and have a good product and stuff before you work with them? In, in what sense? Like if I'm bringing somebody as like a team member or like what? Like what? a client. A client? Like if there's like a Forex trader out there, you sign them, like what's the process like on that? Well, in regards to like any like Forex stuff, like we know like if anyone has all the posts on the same day, you know, that's a red flag. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fake account. It's like, damn, they're um, busy today. Yeah, no, you know, that's a fake account. So like things like that. But for the most part, clients come to us. Yeah. Um, we do do outreach and we have like qualification stuff. I would say one of the new ones, which is a really good qualification tool is only messaging them if they're verified. Cause mm -hmm. now like almost anyone can be verified cause you have like the meta verified. So yeah. essentially the reason why it's a good qualification tool is cause you know, like they're a real person. And another thing you also know is that they're willing to invest mm -hmm. into Instagram, right? So if they're willing to pay that monthly, they're definitely willing, you know, to pay for some other Instagram services as well. Yeah. That's a great point. So when you got started in the agency, right? Like that was five years ago. Yep. And I think we were talking downstairs. You said you have over 2,000 clients that are paying you every single month Correct. actively. Correct. Like that's a huge jump, right? Like I, I've not met a single agency owner that has 2,000 active clients at their agency. So it's massive. And so congrats on that. Thank you. But what does that look like going from like having no experience in the agency space? Like what does that five-year journey look like? If you could walk us through that. Yeah, definitely. So basically the way it started was... I originally did these services myself with my personal brand, okay. then the fitness business. Mm -hmm. And then at that same time, while I was, you know, starting to make a lot of money and build the agency, I also opened up a restaurant with my dad. So I have a restaurant here in Miami. And essentially, I was basically doing all the marketing services that I was offering for the restaurant. Yep. So like mm -hmm. lead gen, you know, building up the building up the IG, all these different things. And so I kind of had these case studies under my belt. That then it just started with, you know, building a team, mm -hmm. consistency, and then just doing it every single day for five years. You're going to get to the point where you can have 2,000 active clients if you have, you know, an incredible offer, if you provide a great service, if you spend additional money to have, you know, client success managers, how I know you guys have, and not, you know, be frugal. Mm -hmm. um, and then all these things, if you just compound and do it consistently over time, you know, you're going you're gonna to get to that level. You just have to make sure you, you know, follow those principles I just mentioned. Yeah, it's so true. I love the, the one piece of it. Well, two things. First, becoming your own best client before anyone else, right? Like you said, you applied the services that you sell to your clients now to yourself or to your existing businesses first. And then number two, building a team, right? So another piece here that we were laid on and, and want to hit on is like the team building aspect. So how do you go from being a solopreneur with this idea for an agency? Like how do you sell the vision and build such a big team that can handle the operation of 2000 monthly clients. Definitely. So the first thing is we have a really, really big team. So we have 150 employees. So wow. that allows us, and these aren't employees necessarily that, you know, are all us based, right? Obviously sure. we're able to reduce our costs, but we have a big team that can manage scale. A lot of times people want to, you know, plug in a hundred thousand a month into their ad spend and they have no infrastructure to actually, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. With, fulfill. With, yeah, fulfill. And, you know, so basically that's kind of how I went about, about that. Yeah, and what was the primary way that you guys got leads? Because I'm just doing the math in my head. That's over a client a day for five years. So yeah, that's no, just like we have more than 2,000 is just active. You know, yeah, we did so, 7,500. We've serviced <laughs> over 7,500 Which is clients. absurd. So, so was it, is it paid media being <laughs> Yeah, a yeah. Thing? A big thing, you know. So for the last like probably the first two years was a, a big part of it was just, you know, we built out like an affiliate system. So when I was like teaching people how to make money, I had all these young kids that were seeing my personal brand. And basically what I did was I was like, you can join my company and you can just start making money, you know, bringing us clients. Yep. So before I got into, you know, paid acquisition, it was just, you know, building out these young kids that were like 18, 19, 20. And then they would like turn into sales reps and they would just do a lot of outreach and then bring in clients. And then we were actually getting like 10 clients a day, you know, just doing it like that. So that Crazy. was working perfectly. 
And then to finish off your question, which I kind of didn't finish, I'll, I'll finish it off now. Basically what happened was I realized when you asked how do you build a team and sell them the vision and keep them for so long, what happened was I realized if they're just going out every day and doing cold outreach and you know, bringing me clients, I'm not really you know, maximizing what I can do for them, right? right? Because they're bringing me clients, they're making me money, I'm making them money, so you have a win-win right there. But it wasn't gonna last forever, right? Because people were gonna get burnt out, they're gonna get tired of sending messages. And so what I did was I said, if I wanna keep all these guys, the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna be the lead provider. So I transitioned from them going out and getting leads every day okay. to me providing them with a booked calendar every single day. And so that's when you know, I was able to really build, you know, take the company to you know, even bigger heights. Everyone was motivated. Everyone wanted to continue building with me. Everyone wanted to stay. And then one thing I did, which I know no other agency owner you've ever talked to does this as well, okay. which is basically I started to pay out on the MRR. So what that means is every single time a client signs up, they get put on the monthly. Like we don't yeah. really have like... We do have one-off services, but for the most part, like our best offers, you're gonna join and then you're gonna stay monthly. What I do is I pay every single salesperson on my team, they get a monthly commission from every single person they've signed on per month. Every so month, not every just that first month, month. Every single month. So like we have guys that literally get 15,000 a month, they don't even need to close a deal. They wow. just get that from what they've done, you know, with the company over the last three and a half, you know, years since they've been here and stuff like that. And that's that. why they're staying with you for and sure. And that's why they're staying because they know, you know, if they leave, well, they're also giving that up. Yeah. And we have, you know, so many, you know, great things also. You know, I'm a great leader. We, you know, have great company, you know, talks every single day. You know, we all really have a passion. We all know we're doing something, you know, with a big plan ahead. Um, and then people have also seen like what I, like I always stick to my word. Like if I say, you know, we're going to be scaling up this year, you know, our revenue is going to be going, you know, up by three times, you know, we make that happen. Right. So because of all these things and you're able to always prove yourself, people want to stick around because my next thing is, you know, one day we're going to take this company to a billion dollar valuation and you guys are, you know, here from the start, you're going to have a piece of that as well. Yeah. Right. So those are all things that I would do to, you know, keep the vision alive. Always. You mentioned you're a great leader. What makes you a great leader? Well, one of those main things that I just mentioned, a lot of people that are bad leaders are people that they try to sell a vision and they don't fulfill on yeah. that promise. I fulfill on every single one of my promises. I've never had, you know, a team member not get paid on time. I've never had a team member not get their monthly, um, you know, like every single client, if that team member signed them on and they happen to like close from an email campaign or something, we don't do that behind their back. You know, they still get royalty on that client. I tell them that if you close that client, you're going to make money on whatever that client signs up. You know, so these are all things that the average agency doesn't do. And I know that because these are things that I came up with in my mm -hmm. own mind. Like they're not yeah, something yeah. that I've watched something where I heard about, you know, something. So these are all things that I know no one is doing. Um, and this is what really, you know, builds a successful team. I love that. A lot of these are like your original ideas. So you're not just looking at what the next agency is doing and, and just being a carbon copy. You're innovating. 100%. That's also what it sounds like, which keeps things exciting and, and interesting. And that's what people want to be a part of. Definitely. Yep. And then you just casually uh, dropped pre-episode that you have a SaaS with like a million users on it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how did that happen? Just a million. Yeah. So I'm, I'm also the co-founder and the CMO of a social media app called LinkMe. And we have, you know, over a million users on there and we have a lot of big names using it. So Patrick but David, Brad Lee, Manny Damn, Koshman. I want to see what this looks yeah, like. Yeah. Adam Weitzman. Yeah. You could just go to their Instagrams, any of their Instagrams, and then just hit the link in their bio. So it's basically like one of our features. If you're not, if you're familiar with Linktree, it's similar yep. to that. But is that, I'm guessing it's the one you have in your bio as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a, so it's a oh, sick looking page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a much nicer version. Oh, like yeah. It doesn't even compare to Linktree. Linktree also charges money. You know, this is 100% free. So it that's has free. Yeah, free. So oh, wow. that's the biggest, you know, gateway into getting it. There's no barrier. It, to it entry. has like goes right into a feed. Yeah, it's a wow. social media app too, so you can post content you know, comments, send DMs and everything. Damn. And so, yeah, that app is 100% free. And so that's how we're able to get, you know, to, you know, well over a million users. That's and fine. we're able to get, you know, all these huge influencers to wow. use it as well. That's cool. So man. what's the business model behind an app or a SaaS that is free to use? So essentially, you know, number one, data is, you know, surpassed oil as the number one, you know, biggest commodity. It's the new so, gold rush. Yeah, so that's like the main thing, like just on its own, for example, like there's an app called Be Real. They have a 600 yeah, yeah. million valuation they and they've never done a single dollar in revenue, right? So 600 mil valuation. Yeah, just because of, you know, their, their users and their, and their data. Hmm. Um, and then the other play is, you know, social media apps. 
Facebook generates 114 billion a year in you know ad revenue, right? So if we just do 0.01% of that, <laughs> you know, you're doing great numbers. So our goal is to you know also come out with a social media platform, or a, so a social media ads platform, right? So you can run ads right on you know directly on the app. And then, you know, also through the LinkedIn bio, you'll be able to leverage that and monetize that through different companies that, you know, pay per view and stuff like that. Makes sense. Yeah, that business model is, is super interesting. And you mentioned like one of the things you're, you're working on now is raising funds, right? So yeah. like, what does that whole process look like? Yeah, so we actually, one of the greatest things about us, a lot of times when companies and startups are raising funds, they typically give away all the equity of the company. Yeah. We've raised 3.5 million and we still retain 95% of the company. Wow. Yeah, so the way that we kind of were given that knowledge is because one of my co-founders, his dad's company is already on the NASDAQ. They IPO'd at a 1.6 billion valuation. And so he raised over $25 million over like 15 years. So all that experience that he went through of like getting fucked over, like seeing how other companies get fucked over, you know, we had that experience kind of given to us before we went into it. And so he's never, you know, we've never raised a single dollar from VCs, you know, it's all mm -hmm. been private angel investors. And so we raised 3.5 million privately. And then now we actually launched something that's called crowdfunding. So instead of going out, you know, and raising from VCs again, we're able now, we got like SEC audited, everything approved, it took a while, where anyone can invest as little as $360. Wow. So you don't need to be an accredited investor, you can just go on the website, which is invest.link.me, and then people will be able to invest, anyone, it doesn't matter, obviously you have to be over 18, and then you can just invest you know, right on the website. That's super sick. So we also have a SaaS company, which is something new to us specifically, right? And I've always wondered, like when a software business in general raises three and a half million dollars, like what does that look like? Do you spend it right away? Like how do you take that money and then figure out okay, where do we allocate this? Like, what are the meetings behind the scenes look like to determine that? Yeah, definitely. So the number one place where we've allocated budget to is to development. So mm -hmm. if you the go product. on the app, yeah, yep. the product. If you go on the app, you'll see like, it's a very impressive app. Like we look almost the same way as, you know, Twitter and Twitter has probably put well over a hundred million <laughs> yeah. into development. You know what I mean? So definitely a big part, you know, of, of raising goes into that because that's how we're able to get all these big people to use us and trust us because they see the app, you know, is well developed and really professional, amazing UI and everything. And then some of the other funds do go to marketing, but like in the last year, we've actually spent zero dollars on marketing. And we've gotten all these huge names because to we market just for it, you. Yeah, we just do it from, you know, we spent money on marketing in the beginning to build up that foundation. And then now that we have that foundation, you know, these people are all marketing us, you know, for free essentially. But we definitely are going to bring in a bigger marketing budget now that we, you know, raise this next round. But, you know, for the most part, a lot of the money has always just gone straight to development. Like the overhead on the team was like 120K a month yeah. just on the development team. So definitely, yeah, that's where most of the funds go and, and marketing. So it's split between those two, development and marketing for the most part. Makes sense. Yeah, it's pretty much similar to what we're experiencing now is all of it just goes to product. It's yeah. expensive. Dude. Yeah, it's Product expensive. is your marketing though, because if it's good enough, it'll just catch on. 100%. Organic. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I want, I want to go back to is I was looking at your website beforehand, the agency. And the amount of case studies you have on there is just absurd. And it's like for every <laughs> vertical you could ever think I'm of. Glad, it's I'm like glad you saw masseuse, that. restaurant, fucking spiritual mentor, yep. all these different things. And I think for the young guys out there, one thing that's super important to get over, like the fact like, oh, I'm young. I sh don't know if I could sign this client, could serve this client. Is like if you stack enough proof, it just becomes completely irrelevant. So like how soon did you become conscious of that? Because I feel like something that some of our clients do, like they'll get great results. They just suck at actually like gathering the case study. So when did you start thinking about that and really like stacking these ones? Yeah, so that's my number one thing for developing a successful business. Like I can build any business from scratch and knowing that all I need to do is build a great social media page and then build unlimited testimonials and then you have a <laughs> successful business right yep. there. So when I had the fitness business, that's where I developed that. Like I had the most testimonials, people saying I lost 35 pounds or I gained 15 pounds, you know, in muscle. So I literally built that business organically just straight off testimonials. Like that's how I got people to trust me at such a young age that I could actually improve their physique and change their health and all that stuff. So when I launched the agency, I knew that was our number one thing. Provide the best service, build a genuine relationship with clients, and they'll send you testimonials for free. You know, all you have to do is ask. 
So I knew that when I was going to build the agency and if I wanted to be, you know, one of the most trusted agencies out there, the number one thing I was going to need was unlimited case studies. On the website, we don't even include all the case study and testimonies that we have because yeah. it makes the website too slow. Even now, it's already <laughs> slowing it down or I got to delete stuff. But yeah. yeah, we just put some of them. Um, and another thing I want to mention since you did, you know, mention that is a lot of agency owners, a lot of coaches that I see in the space, the number one thing that they preach is don't start your agency, don't start your business until you choose a niche. Right. And one thing that you'll you'll see from what he said, which is I have like every single niche, every category you can think of, because I feel like you're putting a limit on yourself. You guys know when you run Facebook ads, you know, you can put certain targeting, but Facebook's always going to make an issue where it's going to target somebody else. Yeah. Right. So if you're saying, you know, I only coach 40 year old moms and then now <laughs> the ad gets shown to a 30 year old mom or it gets shown to, you know, a person in a different industry that you can or, help or a dad that you can help. Right. But since you're only targeting a certain audience, you know, you're capping your income. And so that's why I said, you know, I, I can help any industry. There's not one yeah. industry in the world. The worst that I is when serve. people want to invent a niche. Like, oh, I work with dentist offices. It's like, why? They're like, oh, I read it online. That's the best thing. It's like they're like closing their eyes and like picking out of a hat. <laughs> like, like for, for what reason? You yeah. always ask, why are you picking that niche? And they never know why. No. Just because I'm niching down. It's like, why? Though? We've done that. Yeah, well, not really. When we started our agency, it was kind of the same thing. It was a spray and pray approach. Yeah. And then we went when, to email we, marketing. when we found a specific niche that worked, that's what we doubled down on. Yeah. But we weren't just like, we didn't even know what email marketing was when we started. And that's the niche we ended up yeah. doubling down But I down still on. think like... But email, even still, like we were turning away people that we could help because they weren't yeah. in our niche. Yeah, we, we went just, back. Yeah. We, we started wide, we went narrow, then we started, then we went wide again. It was like, that's pretty common. Who said the well. hourglass? Uh, Adam, Adam, Adam. Uh, a couple episodes ago, but I think that's that's kind of helpful. Like you start to work with a bunch of people and you figure out like who can I serve best. Yeah, and then you find something. You're like, okay, let's get the most out of this opportunity. Then you open it back up again. I feel like that's a pretty natural transition. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I feel like people just businesses just change for the sake of changing. Sometimes, like everybody does it, right? Yeah, that's also another thing that has gotten me to where I am today. When I started the agency, I knew I wasn't going to change the name for a long time you know, change the offer, like change like what, what we're doing. That's the biggest thing. I think that when you can say, you know, I've successfully ran this agency for five years and it's not like I've changed businesses or changed yeah. models or changed everything, that also in its own holds a lot of social proof, holds a lot of trust. Yeah. Um, you know, people can see testimonials from so far back, right? Or they've been watching you and seen that you've been pushing the same company for so long. Yep. Right? It's still All there. Yeah. Yeah. That's so huge because we've been doing business for probably yeah five years but there's not a single company that we've had for five years mm -hmm. it's always every two three years it changes and so exactly so you mentioned even earlier like just the consistency show up every single day and put in the work like that is is the biggest part of it all right and yeah. just so few people are willing to do it um one thing i want to go back to is um the offer right you've mentioned the offer a couple of times so like how long did it take you to, to find like the winning offer that could take you to where you're at today so it didn't take long because it was, you know, what I was doing with the other businesses, right? Yeah. So what I said, like with the fitness business. So when I started that business, a lot of times when people go and, you know, try to build a social, uh, like a social media business, right? They'll start it off and they'll have, you know, a hundred followers and the content they'll be posting of fitness will be them at the gym with a, you know, selfie video on. And then it's just them doing, you know, some curls and it's not like real high quality content. And so what I went and did was I made sure everything that was posted on the page was extremely high quality. So like the first thing I did when I launched the business was I flew out to LA, flew out a photographer, flew out a model, and I created like <laughs> insane content like of different workouts and everything looks super professional. So people started to tie us with like professional fitness brand companies, not just like a high schooler, you know, launching yeah. a little company on his own and stuff. And so that's kind of how I built you know, the offer, because I knew like exactly what I did with that business, exactly what I did with the restaurant is what I was going to do. So essentially some of those things are like when you start off the Instagram, you know, you want to post it on, you know, different theme pages and different influencers and, you know, ads and stuff, right. To build that following and build that foundation. Then you want to make sure every piece of content that you put out looks extremely high quality. So it's well graphic design, you know, everything looks great. And so once you have that, and then you, you know how to do client acquisition, which at that point we were just doing, you know, affiliates and outreach is how yeah. we were building that up. Yep. And then the next thing is, you know, you can go for, you know, press and a nice website and all that stuff. So once I realized like all those key components that you need to build a successful business, I realized that was the offer. And so even before I launched the agency, like, or, or 
kind of like during, right? I already had the offer like in my mind exactly where we were going to go for. And yeah. we stuck to that for like the last five years. And we have branched out to like where we offer, you know, 25 plus services on the site, you know, additional services that we do have. But we always stick to that, you know, main offer. And then all those services kind of come in as upsells. Yeah. Mm. Bro, I just have a genius idea. So someone <laughs> on we'll Twitter, see, we'll see. someone called DM me on Twitter and was like, I see the link in your bio is uh, Hobie, right? Like one of your yeah. competitors. And they're like, we just made a, a pro plan version of our page with all your links on it. Mind if I send it? I'm like, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah. Clicked on it. I'm like, all right, this is dope. Use it in my account now. So like yeah. for you, you can no, just that's exactly what we do. hit up like hella big that's influencers. All we do. That's like, how we got all the influencers. So we literally just say, hey, I see you're using Linktree. It looks horrible. Yeah. And then we just show them what we make them. And then they're like, okay, I'm switching it. Are you pre-making it though? Yeah, we pre-make it. So yeah, the way we, so I think the way like they confirm that you want it. Yeah, you then, say, do you want me to send yeah, it? Yeah, and yeah. When they say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's essentially what we do. Like for the most, yeah. for most people, we'll pre-make it if they're like big enough, and we know they need to see it yeah. before they actually engage. Just because like we have the ability to do that. A lot of those people yeah. like they don't want to pay someone before the person confirms. Right. We're like, yeah. we don't give a fuck about the small money. You know, yeah. we're gonna make it That's for sick. you. But then if it's like smaller people, we obviously don't want to make you know waste time unless they're approving it. Um. So yeah, we do either or. The cool copy yeah. out there is you could be like, oh, I made the page for you. Mind if I send it? Question mark. Then they yeah. say yes, and you scramble and make it, yeah. and then you send it. So yeah. it's not like you're pre-making like a million. No, of course. That's fire. Yeah. Yeah, dude. And like the product speaks for itself, right? People exactly. see it, they're like, holy shit, it's yeah. just dope. And it's free. So like you're not selling somebody anything, so that makes it super easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's just Genius. free value. Yep. Love it, bro. I want to go back real quick to the offer, right? So you're talking about um, not really niching down and just being like super diversified and having just a bunch of different services that are not like innovative services, right? Like that's the whole point here is they're just like lead generation services that thousands of other agencies also offer. So how do you compete and win against just a market that's completely flooded? For sure. So I'm, I'm a big believer that those are also limiting beliefs. Yeah. Right. I don't think that the market is flooded. I think that there's so many people in this world that, you know, even for example, like drop shipping, right? A lot of people drop shipping has been around for so long to where in the first year people were saying it's going to die. In yep. the second year, people were saying it was going to die. In the third year, everyone was always thinking, you know, it's going to get too saturated. Every single person, their mom is launching a Shopify store, right? Yeah. But it still works for people that know what they're doing, yeah. right? So I think there's so many people in this world, thankfully, right? There's not like limited amounts of people in this world. Yeah. So I think that you should never think, you know, that it's too saturated or that there's too many people. Just have a good offer, have a lot of social proof, have a lot of testimonials. And I think, you know, there's, there's so many people out there that still need your service. It's a great way to look at it. Yeah, an abundance mindset, right? And then in the beginning, if you don't have those case studies or that social proof, you offer to work for free. Yeah, and then and then you get them, you know, from from doing that free work, and then now you have case studies to provide when you want the paid work up front. Yeah. So, so what's your for your agency? Like, what's the main KPI? Like, you'll grow a certain amount, you'll get a certain amount of new money or revenue. I mean, yeah. Like what's the end goal for? Yeah, exactly. So it's like for? you pay X amount, we'll grow you X amount, like guaranteed. We have like the services to guarantee that. And then we'll also make sure, you know, you're inside of our private community group where we have, you know, the 2000 plus active entrepreneurs that are all in there. They can network with them. Yep. You also get a video training as well. So 70 plus videos on how to grow, monetize, like 20 yep. different ways on how to monetize, 20 different ways on how to grow. Yeah. We literally provide them everything so that even our, even though our services are all done for you, we're not selling a course. You're we give you that value. for free, yeah. just so that you have yeah. no reason to fail. And then we also go ahead and you know can do their content, their press. You know if they choose to do any of that additional stuff, that's kind of the main offer. Just building you up, setting you up, you know, with clients, Solid. lead generation, and and then so just the primary offer is just follower growth. It's it's a mix of everything. So like we're not just a company where you're gonna go and like buy followers. You're a company where you're gonna have everything you need to launch a successful personal brand or successful okay. business. Cause yeah. we're going to show you in the video training, how to get leads, right? We're going to show you exactly the scripts we use to outreach, cold email, cold DMS, cold LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, all that. We show you how to do that to actually get clients. And then we also give you the option where if you don't want to go out and do the busy work, we can do it for you yeah. in house, which is so, tip, which is most people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like going back to the abundance mindset. One thing that recently happened is Alex Hormozzi. He came out with his book, a hundred million dollar leads. And like, there's all these agency owners that are like, Oh, like now everyone's just going to learn how to do it themselves. And we're going to be out of business. And then we're here thinking like, now everyone's going to learn from a guy that they trust and respect that this is what they need to be doing. And we already know they're not going to do it themselves. So who are they going to go to? the people that are selling those services. And so have you seen like a boost in your agency's growth or just the popularity or demand of your services 
after like an event like what Hormozy did? Not something like drastically that you can see, um, but maybe over time, right? As people get more aware and like yeah. familiar. Um, but for now, it's not like anyone has like signed up and been like, oh, I signed up because I saw yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, Hormozy's fair, book or Hormozy's event. Um, but hopefully, you know, over time, people yeah. get more educated and then that'll lead them to, you know, knowing what they need for their business. Yeah, I mean, in his first book, $100 million offers, he talked about what you talked about of like the offer. And like, if you're selling lead generation, don't just sell lead gen services, like add on sales training, like add on all these things that aren't part of your core service. But we'll, like you said, we'll give them no excuse to fail with what you're currently providing. Yeah, no brainer offer, right? No brainer you, offer. You got to have that. So how can you provide a no brainer offer or such a high level of service for so many clients? Yeah. So everything is, is very systemized, right? Yep. So that's the biggest thing. I don't spend time doing the dirty work or being in the business. I spend time every single day in maximizing how many systems I can build. And if you build that way and spend your energy that way, you're going to be able to handle as many clients as you want. It's yeah. just that people do the opposite. It's like, how long do they take to stop being a sales member in their organization and become the CEO that's going to build systems every single day, right? So for the first two years, as I was building a sales team, I was still taking sales calls. Why though? Because I wanted to max out how much income I make. Because if mm -hmm. all the sales calls are by the sales team, then you cut out 20% commission, you know, you're making less. So I still yeah. wanted to, you know, have some that are 100% commission, right? Yeah. For me. So I would still do that. But then that limited me because all the energy of the sales calls, I wasn't able to build out systems where I can have unlimited sales members come on because instead of taking the calls, I'm actually building out handbooks for this for the sales team that's going to come on, you know, all these different things. And so that's how you manage, you know, as many clients as you can. It's you build as many systems as you can to where you literally can't think of another system that can make things, yeah. flow, things flow better. Right. So. That's how I would go about it if you want to scale to, you know, unlimited heights. And then the other thing also to get there is I didn't just get there without any paid acquisition. So for the last three years, we spend 75000 a month on paid acquisition, right? So like on every, average, you know, yeah, every single month we spend seventy five k. This year, I've wanted to scale that up because the agency has been hovering at like three fifty to 400 k a month okay. for like the last like three years, I'd say. And then the goal for this year was to get it to a million a month. But I've still been having just issues. Just a big jump. Yeah, pretty, uh, a little bit. It's not that big. <laughs> yeah. It's not that crazy. It's just like five more sales members and just scaling an ad spend, I think, to like 200K a okay. month. Um, but I've just been having so many issues with ads platforms. But now I'm just, we just started running Google ads and I'm hopefully, hopefully, you know, we can scale that to The least a restrictive month. ad platform. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, Facebook ads, I've had my account shut down so yep. many times. You know, there's just so TikTok, many issues with that. Is, exactly. Um, so yep. we're trying out, you know, the platform that's going to help us, you know, scale unlimited without having any issues. And then once I have that, like I said, like all the systems are in place where we can get to that number, no problem. I just need the, the best lead acquisition system. Yeah, and, the traffic. So, yeah. To get there. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we've been running Instagram or um, no, Twitter. Twitter, YouTube ads. YouTube um yeah. tiktok youtube or google or whatever yeah, is the same, least yeah. restrictive yeah like just the easiest to um they don't really ban ad mm -hmm. copy or creatives or anything like that from our experience and then you also on, wood. on tiktok like basically I don't, I don't know if you guys know but like with the gold amex card you get like the four x points on yeah. any ad spend yeah. tiktok they're not part of that program because like a chinese company so like amex Jeez. doesn't give you that so like running on google you do get that yeah. 4x, right there so that's go. definitely uh you know, Take a good hack. Yeah. Pay, pays for travel for the year. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. If you're spending yeah, 75 cool. grand a month or yeah. almost yeah. up to Definitely. 200 grand yeah. a month. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, you're, you're pretty motivated and disciplined, but living in Miami, is there ever temptation to go out or things like that? I mean, so I had my fun, like I, in, in like high school and growing up, you know, being here. And then as I got older, like, sure, if there's like certain people coming into town or like, Maybe some of my entrepreneur friends that like want to go out and have a like good time. Like you have time. an event, yeah, something. Yeah, like yeah. you know, I'll do it. But for the most part, like ninety percent of my weekends, I'm just working. And like, as far as like the motivation and discipline to do that, it's just a simple fact that like I know I'm not where I want to be. I know that you know, with the blessings that I have in front of me, with all the resources I already have, like there's, I could take this so much further. So I just don't want to live in. I'd rather live in a state of discipline than a state of yeah. regret. 
right? So yeah. that's that's kind of what leads me to continue wanting to work and not waste time yeah. going out and stuff. You have a unique sure. situation because a lot of people like just moved to Miami. They're like, I want to go yeah. explore. You're like, I've been here my yeah, whole I've life. Been like, here, I already yeah. <laughs> been there, done it. Yeah, no, I think that's a good topic to hit on though. The fact that you're 23 and you're not just good at running the business because we also know a lot of 23 year olds who are great at running their business, but just with personal finances, they're fucking clueless, right? They're, <laughs> they're blowing as much as they yeah. make. So I guess for you, like, how did you get so savvy with all the other investments that you're making outside of just running the primary company? Yeah, so it's just, you know, an example is, is what you just said. A lot of these people are going out and making the mistake of not preserving their capital, right? I'm trying yeah. to build wealth. I'm not just trying to flex on Instagram and stuff. And so I don't waste time, you know, spending 10K on the table to show that I can, you know, afford a table. And then you go home and then you're broke or like go on every, you know, private jet that I can and spend 15,000, then you land after two hours and that money's gone, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, right? So I rather spend my money on things that I know are gonna go up in value, you know, this this apartment, 1.5 million, um, you know, the, the multifamily that I have also is gonna go up like crazy. And I'm just gonna keep on doing that, right? Buying things that I know are gonna go up in value. Another thing that I always say is like, I practically don't spend money on anything that isn't a tax write-off. So if something isn't a tax write-off, I'm not going to buy it, yeah. right? So I don't buy as much like if, if designer clothes was a tax write-off, which it's not, you know, I would probably have way more, but I limit <laughs> myself on how much I buy of that because like I know it's a waste of money because not even a tax write-off, right? Yeah. So any, any dollar that I spend, I want to make sure that it's a, it's a write-off. What about so. the watch? The watch isn't a write-off either, but it's an, it's, an it's an asset, you know, it'll go up in value. You know, right now I was able to get this for like 35K. Last year they were trading at like 50 to 55K, right? Damn. So I know that it'll go up a lot. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's an investment. Yep. Yeah, How about the yours? That that one's the yours was a tax write off. Tax so write off. Yours is over six thousand pounds. So you're able to in the year I got it, you're able to write off one hundred percent of the purchase. Price. What? Yeah. So the that's whole the, thing. Yeah, the whole thing. So I put hundred k down, Holy and I was able shit. to write off two fifty. So you could write off the full amount the full before amount. you even pay it. Well, you write you pay it, and then you write off. Yeah, your tax but like you're comes. financing the rest. So oh like, yeah, before you pay the rest. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Which is like Damn. huge. Is that huge. still a thing or was that just it's like so? It's still a thing, but now it's 80%. Last year was 100%, now it's 80%. Every so year if you're going to pay in taxes, you might as well go buy something. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, definitely. Like another car that's also 6,000 pounds is like a Model X. I'm thinking about buying one just to have like a daily now because <laughs> like the Urus, like I literally use it as a daily. And every time that I use it and like I go on like a one hour drive or something, I like know the valuation is going down because as the miles go up, you know, the valuation goes down. Just so go a little faster. Just dollar bills fluttering out of it. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I've had it for 10 months now, so it's been good. Nice, man. Yeah. Yeah. Was that like the, the first car you wanted or? So the first car that I wanted, so when I moved, so basically when I went to New York when I was 18, started grinding with the agency and my dream car was to get an M4. Okay. And then basically, He's got an M4. nice. And then so when <laughs> when COVID hit, I was like, yo, I'm getting out of New York. Like it was like the worst thing ever in New yeah. York. Like yeah. ghost town. We were there too. Nice, horrible. So not nice. No, not nice. <laughs> no, like nice. Yeah, not nice. But it was horrible. And so I wanted to have like you know access to like going to the beach and like obviously Miami was way you know more chill. You didn't need to like show your Vax card every restaurant you wanted to go yeah. to and stuff. Yeah. Um which I finessed that, you know, I never got vaccinated, but I just like, you know, got that shit done. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was the worst thing ever. So I moved to Miami and then the second I moved to Miami, I was like, all right, it's time. I launched an agency. I'm crushing it. I'm buying an M4. So then I bought the M4 and then once they came out with like the new face for the M4, I sold the M4, didn't have a car for like a year. Cause I just wanted to, you know, save. Uber, not, not, not save. I didn't need to save. Oh, I was yeah. crushing it. Nothing to do with saving. <laughs> The car was fully paid, you know, it was, it was all good. I just kind of wanted to not have any like attachments, right? I just wanted to, you know, when I travel places, I'm just working in the Uber, you know, not wasting yep. any time. Just wanted to maximize my efficiency. And then when I had a big year, like last year, 2022, I did over 1.5 million in profit. So I knew I had to like buy, that was even like after the years, yeah. right? Like on like me buying the years, it would have been like 1.75 million, yeah. you know? So wow. like I had to do a lot of things to reduce on taxes. Um, so yeah. Like what else? Buying the years, one thing. Well, was... I could have done more. So I was, I was trying to buy the years. I didn't like reduce it all the way. I, I needed to do way more. So I was bought the years and then I was also going to sign on a real estate property so I could do the same thing I did with this one. But then 
I took too long to make the decision. So the closing date was going to be January 6th. Oh. So by six days, I was like, if it's not going to be for this year, you it's know, not I'm not going to buy it right now. So I kind of got fucked over with that. So the only main thing I did was obviously like paying my team like very, very well. So Christmas bonuses and yeah, stuff all like that. that. And yeah. then, you know, getting the URS um, nice. as a full write-off. So this yeah. year, what are you going to do differently? So this year I got this, which is a big write-off. This will be like this around... Table? No, not this table. <laughs> this, this unit. This unit will be around like... Uh, Probably like 350k right off. Wow. I paid way more. I put 600k down, so yeah. I'm not getting everything that I put down, but a good amount. You know, I'll be able to write off um, with bonus appreciation. This will be like 350k. Um, I'll probably get like a really nice Model X, which will be you know another maybe like 100k. Um, and then just like spending on like a lot of like materials and office materials and stuff that I'll be doing, and again just paying my team very well. Those are the main things that I'll be doing. And then next year, you know, there'll be more. Maybe there's a private jet, a yacht, you know, there, all these things are right off. So we'll see what we so do. Do you have a, do you have an office around here? I don't have an office. So the team is just fully remote. remote. Yeah. That's, that's kind awesome. of, I didn't, once again, I didn't want to have attachments. Like once you get into the office life, you essentially are like putting yourself in a nine to five, you know, like that's how I see it. So I kind of like the freedom of like having a team online and still being able to do big numbers without relying on an office. It's also like, unnecessary expenses which is still good because like obviously it's write-offs but things like you know having to pay for like food for the team every day like all that stuff like when you run online like you don't really need to worry about that for the most part like they'll pay with their own you know commissions and checks and salaries so that's kind of why i decided to do that in the future i may um you know but for now it's, it's been fun this way nice. you know i can travel do whatever i want i don't need to worry about like people being at the office you go back so. to paraguay a lot Uruguay, Uruguay but my bad. Not, not, not too often. Not too often. That's Suarez, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, I got that. Love right. Suarez. Yeah, yeah good. Nice. All right. We're redeeming yourself there. <laughs> yeah, um, that's good. What, so, okay, what is like, this is kind of a generic question, but I am actually interested. It's like, what does your day to day look like running all these things that you're mentioning? Yeah, so I wake up every day at 6 45 a.m. So that's with the taser? Yeah. And we heard about yeah, that. Heard is about that still that. Thing? I was yeah, watching I was that like, video. I was, I was like, like, yo. Is this real? Yeah, it's real, bro. So every day we wake up. Who's the taser guy? My other co-founder, with, not with the agency, but with Link Me. Yeah. Okay. So we wake up every day at 6.45, and then I, I grind, you know, on... Hold just, up. We, we just got to explain what the taser is, because if they didn't <laughs> see that video, they're yeah, going to be like, what yeah. the fuck is he the talking taser about? taser essentially, like, one of my co-founders, like, if we wake up, like... At, if we wake up at like 6.50 or something like that, like he comes with the taser, like if you're not <laughs> down at 6.45, it's good to like keep us all in check and discipline, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I kind you of fuck with it. just wake up fighting for your life every day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Have yeah. you ever missed it? Nah, like I, I'm, that shit, I, don't, I don't get touched by that. Taser, I was going to say, I, I wouldn't yeah, miss it either. He comes in like threatens, but I'm like, you're not doing shit, I'm up. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's a, good, it's a good way to hold us all accountable. Yeah. For sure. Good business practice. Not a lot of people talk about that. They won't, they won't teach you that in college. So you live with your co-founder? Yeah. Nice. Yes. Talk about that because all three of us co-found our business and we lived in a Tampa apartment, three bed. It was like war zone office, living room. <laughs> yeah. All in one. So. Yeah. So that's what it is. Like it's, it's pretty good. I mean, one of the main reasons why I do that is because the investors like pay for the apartment. So I don't even pay rent to like live with them. So I just like, you know, I obviously could afford to pay rent, yeah. but I'm just like, you know, free rent, whatever. It's cool. You know, I do my thing, travel, whatever. So, yeah, we, we live all together. It's good to like hold us accountable. Also, when you have like investors putting big check sizes and you like mention that to them, they like that too. So like it has its benefits nice. for sure. Okay, yeah. so 6.45, you wake up. What happens after that? Yeah, 6.45, I wake up. And cold shower, yell at the yeah, window. Yeah, cold shower, <laughs> main thing for sure to like get myself ready for the day. I think a lot of times people like struggle to wake up early because they struggle to walk into the shower. But the second you're in the shower, you're, you're good. up, you're good. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not hard at all. So definitely, you know, take a cold shower. And then, you know, for the most part, I'll have uh, celery juice, like just like on an empty stomach. And I'll, I always fast till like 1 to 2 p.m., mm -hmm. I also drink a, a Uruguayan tea that's called mate. So that's also like super good for like great caffeine, even better than coffee. And it also holds off like any hunger. So, it, oh, you know, wow. it pushes your fast longer. So I drink that too. But yeah, dude, after I wake up and I'm, and I'm going, I'm just grinding and banging out all my to-do lists that I set up the night before. And then it's just a consistency of, of doing that. Probably at like 7 p.m. I'll, I'll wind down on work and go to the gym see family after that and then by like 10 30 you know I'm, I'm in bed so that's cool yeah what's the relationship like with the family at this point because i know again you the way you grew up was not ideal but where you're at now is a lot different yeah so 
the, f the family stuff is great. My parents got divorced when I was two years old, so I have like you know those like different lives lives with with them. Like, are they both in the yeah, states? Yeah, they both live in Miami, which is good. They moved here and then they got divorced when I was two. Got it. Um, but yeah, they both live here, so it's it's great. My relationship with my dad is amazing because my dad has always struggled financially. Like he's been in debt like his whole life. Still right now, like he's in debt, but like we're recovering out of that, like getting him out of that. And I also like was able to put up like through the money I generated with the agency. 210k to buy out the partners that we originally had the restaurant when we first started because he didn't have enough oh, wow. money to like be there so we bought them out with that and then now we have 100 percent of the restaurant and that's still there that's yeah still that's there. still there we have we have a bigger location now that we opened too so yeah my goal was always to make money and like help my dad get out of this like depression that like not having money brings and that's what i've done like you know he's in a much better position financially like we have two locations for the restaurant like things are growing everything you know that's does... awesome let's plug it what's the restaurant called luna pasta e dolce awesome. yeah 69th street in biscayne Miami. italian joint yeah italian everything is homemade empanadas steaks everything is yeah you guys should go you know i'll send you, guys, well, send you guys a good discount but <laughs> yeah it's, it's amazing and then um you know with my mom everything is good and i think that you know a lot of times people like can can struggle with their parents because not everyone gets dealt like the best parents right like there's yeah. situations where like you may have like shitty parents or like they talk shit or they're alcoholics and stuff so like i don't always go like the one size fits all like oh like you should you know make sure you have an amazing relationship with their parents like i know some people that like genuinely can't because their parents are like so fucked up in the head and like yeah you know sometimes it's not like your choice or like not every single person in this world is given like the best parents right? right so i'm thankful you know that that i have good parents you know that have been there for me supported me giving me confidence um and i definitely think like you need to be the leader of the relationship with your parents like if it was just based off like whatever is said i could be like fighting with my mom or like my dad because like obviously like they can say things that like may not align with like how i feel or you know just different things but i'm somebody that i've learned to control what i say control my emotions and that's helped my relationship a lot with my parents like growing up you know maybe i would fight with them like once a week and then now i probably haven't fought with them in like seven years because like if they say something that i don't like or anything like i'm not reacting and fighting and you know talking back i'll literally just you know respect it and and move on and that's thing, something that i kind of just wanted to plug in and mention because i think having a relationship with your parents and your family is really important because you could have all the money in the world you could have you know great health but then when you want to like lean on somebody's shoulder or talk to somebody or have somebody tell you that they truly love and care for you and they know it's not just for your money and stuff like that, I think it's very important to to have that. And I always mention, you know, Ty Lopez says that, you know, the good life, love, health, wealth and happiness. Yeah, <laughs> I think those are the four principles that you should always make sure you have in your life if you want to truly have, you know, a happy, successful life. Absolutely, yep. bro. One of the things you mentioned there is like just the way you handle relationships, at least with your parents, it. I feel like all relationships are the same, especially business partnerships. It's like the crazy ex-girlfriend or whatever. But like, how does that correlate the relationship with business partners and even managing people at such a large organization? Yeah, definitely. I think it's it, it plays a huge role. You know, this sense of, uh, you know, understanding and development is actually something that I learned and adopted from Dale Carnegie, right? Okay. How to Win Friends and Influence People was a book that I started reading at 17 and I reread until this day. And it's something that, you know, brought in my spectrum on the understanding of human beings and how to build, you know, general relationships. And I wish I read that book, you know, or that it was taught in school, right? Because yeah. it really shows you how to build general relationships, you know, how to make people like you, you know, and, and a lot of times that isn't taught, you're just expected to like have it as a gift, but mm -hmm. not everybody has it. And so that helped me a lot, like with my team for sure. There may be times when somebody on your team gets a little bit of an ego or cocky and talks bad. And then if they talk bad to you and then you, th you come with an even bigger ego and then you're talking even worse to that person and that spreads to other team members, you know, you're poisoning the company. Mm -hmm. And so as a leader of such a big organization, I've learned to always hold my words, you know, be careful with what I say, think twice, you know, leave the phone there, give it an hour and come back to, you know, yeah. how you want to respond. What do we right? say? Like, let it, let it cool off. Yeah. Let it cool off. It's huge. And so that when you have a big team and you have a lot of people watching you and seeing you buy a Lamborghini or see, you got to be, you know, very, sharp. very sharp, know exactly what you're saying, know how you're dealing with situations. Psychology is, is everything, you know, yeah. so you got to have your psychology on point and really know what they're thinking before you talk or any moves that you make. Yeah. And, I mean, Gary Vee talks about this all the time. Like, instead of making assumptions, like, ask questions, right? Like, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Why is that? 
And instead of like, oh, you're wrong, like coming from a very, you know, high ego, high emotion standpoint. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was like, Scott, okay. He's yeah. like bent over in the oh, corner. Man. He's it, it, a Mr. Producer back here. We're, we've done, what's this, episode six? six on the trip so far in the, in the past like, like 36, hours. 36 hours so every time we do this we've done it at a different location each time so he's just like a nascar crew just <laughs> just picking this thing up deconstruct the set reset yeah, no i'm thankful for you guys amazing so he, he setup. Setup. thank yeah, you bro oh dude thank you for hosting us this is awesome i want to go back to um link me for a second because one of the things i'm always curious about with companies like that obviously the data is a major play but do you ever think about going like further downstream like if I had like a book of call funnel, like also providing like scheduling capabilities or like the same capabilities a SaaS like type form would do. Like I'm curious to hear what product developments can be made on top of what like the regular core functionality is like yeah. what Linktree originally said. Yeah, that's make. a great point. So one of the biggest things about, you know, when you're building a, an app or yeah. a social media platform is it's a platform, right? Which means like you can add things onto this platform all the time. Once you have people there on this platform, you know, you just develop new features and bring things to the table. So like one thing we're working on right now is like having a very efficient CRM, right? So yeah. people, you know, scan somebody's code. And then now when, you know, you have a pop-up that like allows you to put notes. So you really remember like what you spoke about with that person and different things like that. So we're Smart. definitely plugging in. Yeah, a lot of different tools and stuff and, and different features that we can monetize from and just give people a better user experience for yeah, sure. Love that. I love that. I want to go into that as well in terms of like growing a SaaS company or a product like that. Affiliate has to be one of the biggest ways, right? Like they talk about the multiplier effect and click funnels is one of the examples we look at is like how they grew so quickly is because of the affiliate program and like the dream car and just the way they manage it all mm -hmm. yours it's the approach of like going after these influencers and, and having them put your product essentially in their bio that everyone is going and, and checking i guess what's the overall affiliate strategy or the multiplier effect that you're seeking um with this app yeah so number one is getting big people to to use it when mm -hmm. something is seen by many different people or many big influencers are using it consumers it's it's a form of retargeting yeah. right it's like oh you saw it on him now you saw it on this other person now you're going to download it right so definitely that's one of the biggest ones because not only does it lead like the average consumer to go ahead and join the app and start using it but also big influencers right yeah. when big influencers see that that's a new cool thing that every huge influencer is using they're going to download it make an account and set it up for themselves right so that's one of the biggest things and then we also do have you know an average general affiliate program where like if you're in the us every person that you have sign up on the app you'll get a dollar and then we have like an ambassador dashboard that like tracks it all and like certain bonus prizes that you'll win yeah, and stuff too. At tiers. Yeah, exactly. So we do have that. That works pretty well. We don't push it too much because we don't want to like give off like the, you know, like a pyramid scheme vibe, yeah. even though like it's not because it's like a one tier system. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of people have this misconception. Yeah. So we don't like push it too much, but it's in the app. You can do it. Certain young kids do it. And then the influencers also are able to do that too. So like yeah. anyone who signs up from their link, they'll get a dollar get a as dollar. well. Um, so that's kind of how we incentivize people without paying anyone up front. I love it, bro. And what's the long-term play with that? Is, is it an exit? Do you want to go public? What, what does that look like? Well, one thing is like we wanted to go public. We're supposed to go public in 2024. Like we have like people that already like see what we're doing and like they're, they're aware that we're capable of being on the NASDAQ already. But basically the reason why we're kind of steering away from going public is because our co-founder's dad who went public like if you guys have seen like the markets, like some people will say, you know, S&P has gone up a little bit, but overall, like the last two years, the markets haven't been very strong, right? Yeah. So a lot of companies took a big hit. And so that's probably what would happen to us. So right now we just want to like remain private, like keep raising like through crowdfunding, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. And then just build it to as many users as we can. That's like the number one goal, as many, you know, big people using it. And then if, you know, we get offered, you know, by a big company to buy it, you know, we'll sit down with the board and see if it's the right decision. Or, you know, in a few years, if the market's looking better, you know, we'll, we'll plan out an IPO. So right now, it's just about like not focusing on the end result, just focusing on like, you know, stacking up bricks every single day. That's yeah. what we're focused yeah. on. And just, yeah, every day, like getting more people. There's, there's like, there's so many people that we can still get, yeah. you know, you yeah, don't run out. Never, so it's never, it's never ending. Yeah. So yeah, it's just about building every day, see how high we can get it. And then we know the more the more users we have, the more influences we have, the bigger the valuation, right? So that's that's our goal. Yeah. 
I feel like so every my last question at least every business owner or entrepreneur has like this one ultimate goal in mind right like for Gary V it's to buy the Jets mm -hmm. um, we just saw Patrick Bet David he bought a piece of the Yankees right so it could be a, a sports franchise it could be exiting for a certain valuation like do you have something like that or is yours just kind of like a forever game see what happens well my first my first goal like right now in my career which has been my goal since like seven years old is to make my dad a millionaire. So I like that. I reached that for myself. My goal was like to do that for my dad. And so that's why I put a lot of time into, you know, building this restaurant, you know, yeah. bought out these people. Now we have hundred percent ownership. We launched another location. Like we're doing a lot of things because with the restaurant, like if you don't have multiple locations or if you're not doing it at a big scale, like the margins are very thin, it's going to yeah. take a long time to be a millionaire. And like, I could just tell my dad, you know, come work for my company. You'll make more. <laughs> yeah. But like, he's been in the restaurant industry since he was like 20 years old. So it's always been like a passion for him to like have his own restaurant and stuff. So I want to make him a millionaire through that. Right. Doing so what he wants. yeah, exactly. So the goal is to just keep building that up. You know, maybe he can, you know, one day we, we exit out of the restaurant, you know, over time and that's how he can do it. But yeah, it's definitely my goal. Like I want to see my dad, you know, kind of step away from work and like be able to travel and like, you know, go to Europe and do all these things that like he's dreamed of doing, but hasn't really had the ability to do so. So definitely that's like my main thing, like make my dad a millionaire. And then after that, my goal is to just, you know, be a philanthropist, like, and help as many people as I can. Like when I was like 12, 13, I took like a lot of trips to like go to Costa Rica, build schools. I went to Colombia wow. in the desert of called La Guajira and I built another school as well there too. So now I've been like super busy. Like I just went to DR and did like another trip like that, like helping uh, an orphanage as well. So I've been like super busy, like scaling the business, but definitely once I feel like, you know, I've, I've accomplished a lot, I made my dad a millionaire, you know, the businesses are, are running on its own, they're doing very well. I want to spend like, just like a full year and then like continue to do that. Like maybe like three to four months out of the year, just going to these countries building schools you know even another thing too that i've thought of is a lot of times people go to like these countries or organizations to help out they'll go and like they'll give some money or they'll give something but then like that'll kind of run out so one thing that i've thought of is a lot of the jobs that i give to people like online i'm always hiring like i've hired like probably over a thousand people now i only have like 150 that i kept but over time i've hired like over a thousand people and a lot of these jobs are things that like somebody doesn't need to speak english to do yeah. they don't need to be very smart so i've been thinking like if i go to these organizations and these foundations and i give them like phones which i can literally get like an iphone se on amazon for like 200 bucks and i like show them how to like do these jobs that i do yeah. and i'm actually like giving them jobs True. so like they can have like a long-term salary a long-term income that's that actually awesome. like helps them long term so that's my next biggest goal for sure i love it serving, yeah, serving those people it's huge yeah you yeah. guys want to do a lightning round we haven't done one in like four or five episodes all right let's do it <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll open it up with you christian all right so my first one well, my only lightning round question is always if you could have dinner with any three people this table right here who would be sitting in these three seats if I could have dinner with any three people, who would be sitting here? Yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, Ray Dalio, Jay-Z, <laughs> and Dale Carnegie. Damn. Yeah. Damn. That would be a fire dinner. That's a good trio. We haven't heard, I don't think we've heard any of those guys. No. no? Maybe Jay-Z Jay once sarcastically, because yeah. that's yeah. always like the meme, like 500 grand or dinner with Jay-Z. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. 500 grand. I just like the Jay-Z the Jay thing, like to meet somebody like that, because... You know, you really know, like, where they came from, you know, like, yeah. from the hood, like, literally from nothing. And then, like, at such a young age, like, achieved billionaire status, um, you know, they definitely have a lot of gems to provide that maybe, like, you know, somebody like Jeff Bezos, nothing against him, but, like, you know, his parents were able to give him, like, a million dollar investment into Amazon, stuff like that. Like, maybe Jay-Z or Jay-Z didn't have that, right? So there's certain things there that yeah. I kind of like um, from his end, for sure. Oh, dude, it'd be one of the most interesting dinners ever. Yeah. Especially, like, if it was just with Jay-Z. Like, the stories he must have, that's unbelievable. Yeah, big Jay-Z fan. I'm a huge Jay-Z fan. I listen <laughs> so much Jay-Z. Yeah. Um, my question is always something along the lines of, like, if you could put out one last piece of content. Let's just say it's a tweet. It makes it easier because you write... Um, well, before it was like 140 characters. Now I don't even know what it is. But let's just say it's a short form piece of uh, content, like a tweet. Last piece of content you could ever put out um, specifically to maybe a younger version of you or just guys that are in the agency space looking to get started. Like what's your best piece of advice? If you want to get rich, if you want to become a millionaire, 
you need to build a team. This doesn't mean that you need to be a CEO. You can build a team within the company that you're in. So like even some of my guys on my sales team, they can build teams of like, they can go out and bring anyone on as an affiliate under them, you know, and they can actually generate them passive income because any sales that they bring, they'll make money from. And if you are, you know, in the position of like, you have your own business, you want to make sure that you're building out as many sales members as you possibly can because that's the only way you're going to generate millions of dollars at a very fast pace. If it's only you selling, you're going to limit yourself to how much you can make. But if you build an organization that loves your vision, believes in what you do, they know you're a loyal and respectable person, you're going to generate you know, millions of dollars because the only way to do it is with having a lot of people that are selling your service at the same time. Yeah, I love it, bro. Spot on. That's what I always Fire. say too, is just build a team, find reputable partners, and people are the only way to scale. That's awesome. We talked a ton about your businesses today. I don't feel like we've talked too much about the personal brand, but they're intertwined, right? Your personal brand with the agency. I'm curious, if you could be known for one thing long-term, Dre Medici, like your personal brand, what would that be? Humble, genuine, and just overall a good person that was here to help as many people as he can and just wasn't all about the money and was all about, you know, just really transforming people's lives. That's always been my goal. Love that. So, Solid, yeah. bro. Awesome, dude. Love me, bro. I would say every Napoleon Hill book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and then every uh, Gary Vee book, I think, for beginners is a great Fact. start, yep. for sure. I yeah. love it, bro. Uh, <laughs> where can our audience find you, follow you, and, and get involved with everything you got yeah, going on? Yeah, main place, just uh, follow me and DM me on Instagram if you came from this podcast. We'll connect. And yeah, Instagram, Dre Medici, D-R-E-M-E-D-I-C-I. Hell yeah, bro. Awesome, bro. Awesome. Appreciate you for jumping on. That was great. Crush it. Thank you, boys.